queens of the world. Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom and Commonwealth Realms. February 6, 2022 marks the 70th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth II's ascension as Queen of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth Realms. She is the longest reigning monarch in British history. She has lived her life near the center of many of the significant historic events of the last century. Her life has spanned a world war, the end of the British Empire, 14 British Prime Ministers, countless social, political, and technological changes, and many royal family upheavals. Four out of five Britons were not alive before Elizabeth was queen. Let's take a look at her remarkable life. Check out my new podcast, History Tea Time. The first episode, A History of Royal Incest and Inbreeding, will be launching June 2nd, 2022. Check out History Tea Time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever fine podcasts are enjoyed. Elizabeth was born on April 21st, 1926, at the London home of her maternal grandparents. Her father, Prince Albert, Duke of York, known as Bertie, was the second son of King George V, and her mother, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, was the daughter of a minor Scottish aristocrat. After a difficult pregnancy, baby Elizabeth had to be delivered by emergency cesarean section, a procedure which was far less common than it is today. Bertie wrote to a cousin about his newborn daughter. She is too delicious and is such a great joy to us both. Elizabeth is progressing wonderfully well and the baby is flourishing. The baby princess was baptized at Buckingham Palace and named Elizabeth after her mother, Alexandra after King George V's mother who had died six months earlier, and Mary after her paternal grandmother, who was queen consort at the time. She lived a quiet, happy life with her parents, who preferred to raise her in a flat in London rather than at a royal palace. As a toddler, she had trouble pronouncing her own name, so called herself Lilibet, which remained a pet name within the family. She was especially adored by her grandfather, King George V, whom she affectionately called Grandpa England. At four, Lilibet was joined by a younger sister, Margaret. She also arrived via cesarean section, and after both difficult deliveries, the Duke and Duchess decided that their family was complete with their two cherished daughters. There wasn't much pressure on them to produce a male heir, as at the time everyone assumed that Bertie's older brother, Prince Edward, would marry and someday pass the throne to his own sons though King George may have had an inkling of what was to come. He remarked, I pray to God that my eldest son will never marry and have children, and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. Elizabeth and Margaret were educated at home by their mother and governess. At the time, aristocratic girls were not sent to school. The Duchess's own education had ended when she was 13. But despite this limitation, she was a bright and curious woman who read voraciously. She tutored her daughters in history, language, literature, and music. Both girls were doted on by their parents, who presented them with a Pembroke Welsh corgi named Dookie, the first of many pet dogs Elizabeth would adore. Margaret inherited her mother's devotion-winning charm and spontaneity and became quite a mischief maker while Elizabeth took after her more reserved, shy, and formal royal side. Winston Churchill said of the two-year-old princess, she has an air of authority and reflectiveness astonishing in an infant. Her cousin described her as a jolly little girl, but fundamentally sensible and well-behaved. Elizabeth particularly resembled her paternal grandmother in both appearance and temperament. Queen Mary was always more devoted to her royal duties than her children, but she was a far better grandmother than mother. In January 1936, when Elizabeth was nine years old, her grandfather, King George V, died, and her uncle became King Edward VIII. 
From the start, the new monarch obstinately refused to take his role seriously. He often left secret government documents lying around his country house for party guests to peruse. Edward was obsessed with an American, Wallace Simpson, who, because she was divorced, would not be accepted as his wife and queen by the government, church, or the British people. Within a year of his ascension, Edward used Wallace as a romantic excuse to give up the job he had always dreaded. He abdicated the throne, left the country, and married Wallace. He never considered or even consulted his younger brother Bertie about dumping the crown on his head. When Bertie told his mother of the abdication, he broke down and sobbed like a child. He was a desperately shy man and suffered a severe stutter. He was worried that he was unequal to the task, but unlike his brother, he had a strong sense of morality and duty and took up the heavy mantle of monarchy, becoming King George VI. He was crowned in Westminster Abbey on May 12, 1937, the date which had been planned for his brother's coronation. Young Elizabeth thus became the heir presumptive. According to the succession laws of the time, if her parents did have a son, then he would overtake Elizabeth's place in the line to the throne. So, with that slim possibility, she was never officially heir apparent. For this same reason, she was never made Princess of Wales, the traditional title of the heir apparent. And she was never made Princess Royal because her aunt, Princess Mary, was holding that title. But within the family, it was now clear that 10-year-old Elizabeth would someday be queen. In 1939, the now royal family of four toured the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth. A dashing 18-year-old cadet, Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark, was assigned to escort 13-year-old Princess Elizabeth and her younger sister during the tour. He was their third cousin through Queen Victoria and second cousin through King Christian IX of Denmark. Elizabeth was smitten and she and Philip began exchanging letters as the young naval officer was shipped off to fight in World War II. Despite their hesitations, George VI and Elizabeth were an exceptional king and queen and became exceedingly popular. During the war, they toured the country extensively, visiting bombed neighborhoods and munitions factories to boost morale. Queen Elizabeth was so revered that Hitler called her the most dangerous woman in Europe. The couple remained in London even after Buckingham Palace was bombed and they narrowly escaped with their lives. After a Nazi plot to kidnap Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret was uncovered, the Prime Minister recommended that the girls be evacuated to Canada. But their mother refused, stating, The children won't go without me, I won't leave without the King, and the King will never leave. They did decide to send the girls to the safer location of Windsor Castle, 25 miles outside of London, and close enough for them to visit their daughters on weekends. Elizabeth and Margaret remained at Windsor for five years. The wartime castle was dark and depressing, as was most of the nation, but the princesses did their best to keep up morale. They staged Christmas pantomimes for the local children and raised money for the Queen's Wool Fund, which made warm winter garments for soldiers. At 14, Elizabeth made her first radio broadcast during BBC's Children's Hour. She addressed and encouraged other children to be brave during terrifying air raids and evacuations from their homes. At 19, Elizabeth became a driver and mechanic for the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service, the women's branch of the British military. On May 8, 1945, the Nazis were defeated, and the bloodiest war in human history finally came to an end. Teenage Elizabeth and Margaret were granted permission by their parents to go out on the streets of London incognito and celebrate with the people. Elizabeth recalled later lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on the tide of happiness and relief. 
All this time, Elizabeth had been corresponding with Philip, who was now a lieutenant and a decorated war hero. Once back in the UK, he reconnected with Elizabeth, and their childhood friendship blossomed into a romance. Her parents were not enthusiastic about the match. Philip was a prince without a country. He was a descendant of the Greek royal family, who had been exiled when he was a baby. Though Philip had been raised primarily in the UK by his British grandmother, his four sisters had been raised in Germany, and two of his brothers-in-law were Nazis. In the summer of 1946, Philip asked the king for his daughter's hand in marriage. George agreed, but requested that the announcement be delayed until Elizabeth's 21st birthday the following April. In the meantime, Philip renounced his Greek and Danish royal titles, converted to Anglicanism, and officially took the surname Mountbatten from his British relatives. To distract their daughter, the king and queen brought her with them on a state visit to South Africa. There, they attempted to promote unity amidst growing tensions between black and white people. During the tour, Princess Elizabeth took the opportunity to give a speech swearing her loyalty to the service of her people. The tour was grueling, and the goal of unity was a failure. A year later, the Africana Nationalist Party took over the country and established apartheid. Around the world, the once vast British Empire was changing, with many former colonies declaring independence. King George accepted with grace the dissolution, relinquishing his various foreign titles of emperor and king, and taking up the new title of head of the Commonwealth with pride. Elizabeth and Philip were married in Westminster Abbey on the morning of November 20th, 1947. As Britain was still enduring poverty and rationing after the war, the government advised a low-key wedding. Elizabeth bought the silk for her dress with war ration coupons. But the people were thrilled to have something to celebrate after the many years of hardship. The happy couple spent their honeymoon at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. They brought Elizabeth's corgi, Susan, with them. They then took up residence at Clarence House, the traditional London home of the heir to the throne, since King William IV. Six days before their first anniversary, Elizabeth gave birth to their first child, Charles. King George issued letters patent allowing Elizabeth's children to use the style and title of royal prince or princess. As female line descendants, they were not automatically entitled to this right. Philip was still a naval officer and was posted several times to the British colony of Malta. The couple left Charles with his grandparents and enjoyed some of the most carefree times of their marriage on the Mediterranean island. Elizabeth was free from the pressure of the royal family and able to live a simpler life as the wife of a naval officer, attending beach parties and dances. In 1950, they welcomed their second child, Anne. King George was diagnosed with lung cancer after years of smoking and stress. As his health began to decline, Elizabeth, as his heir, took up more royal duties. These many duties kept Elizabeth away from her children, and young Charles once didn't recognize his mother. She had a nursery train car outfitted so that Charles and Anne could travel with her, at least while she was in Britain. In 1952, it was decided that the king was too ill to undertake an extensive tour of the Commonwealth, so Elizabeth and Philip were sent in his place. George waved his daughter farewell at the airport, went to the Sandringham estate with his wife and daughter Margaret, and died a few days later. In Kenya, Elizabeth and Philip had just returned from a camping trip when word of the king's death reached them. Philip broke the news gently to his wife, who was heartbroken. As the heir automatically ascends the throne upon the death of the monarch, she had already been queen for several hours without knowing it. When asked what her regnal name would be, she replied, Elizabeth, of course. And so she became Elizabeth II, following the 16th century queen of the same name. Both were 25 when their reigns began. 
Many Scots were unhappy with the title of their new queen, as Scotland had not been united with England until the reign of James I and VI, after the death of Elizabeth I. So the new queen was actually the first Queen Elizabeth of Scotland. She returned immediately to the UK to attend her father's funeral and to take up her new role as sovereign. On the 2nd of June, 1953, Elizabeth walked into Westminster Abbey, decked in the centuries-old crown jewels and regalia, and took the solemn coronation oath. Hers was the first coronation to be televised and spurred thousands to buy their first TVs. Philip, now officially Prince Consort, organized much of the ceremony. In the UK, the husbands of Queen's Regnant, or Queen's in their own right, are barred from taking the title King. But Queen Victoria had taken her husband's last name of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Philip's uncle, Louis Mountbatten, made toast to the new Mountbatten dynasty. But Prime Minister Winston Churchill advised Elizabeth to keep the royal name Windsor. Philip privately complained that he was the only man in the country not allowed to give his name to his own children. They had a conventional 1950s marriage, and Philip was uncomfortable playing a subordinate role to his wife in public. In compensation, Elizabeth let Philip call the shots when it came to their children, and he was often harsh on Charles. He insisted that his son attend his own alma mater, Gordonston, a Spartan boarding school in northern Scotland. Charles was miserable and bullied there. Queen Elizabeth was soon inundated with the many royal duties demanding her attention. As a constitutional monarch, the government is formed in her name, but she is barred from expressing political opinion publicly. She is still very much involved in the background. She receives daily red boxes filled with reports on the goings-on of the nation, and she meets weekly with the Prime Minister, during which she may advise and warn when necessary. Twice in 1957 and 1963, Elizabeth was required to appoint a Prime Minister, as the Conservative Party had no formal mechanism for electing a leader of its own. Both times, she was criticized for her choice, and the party has since amended their practices to keep the queen above politics. Following the coronation, Elizabeth and Philip embarked on a seven-month tour of the Commonwealth. Elizabeth became the face of the Commonwealth around the world, and not just on stamps. With the jet age, she has been able to go to dozens of countries in person on state visits. She is the head of state of the 16 nations in the Commonwealth realms. The realms are part of the Commonwealth of Nations, a political affiliation of 53 nations, former British colonies who do not all recognize the queen as head of state. The queen was discouraged from visiting Ghana in 1961, as her host, President Kwame Nkrumah, was a target of assassination. Elizabeth dismissed fears for her own safety and went on the trip anyway, winning over Ghana and preventing Nkrumah from allying with the Soviet Union and giving them a foothold in Africa. The queen continued to have a close but complex relationship with her sister, Margaret. She wished to marry Peter Townsend, a divorcee 16 years her senior. Elizabeth was head of the Church of England, which did not permit divorcees to remarry. So she continuously put off granting her sister permission to marry, until Margaret had no choice but to give Townsend up. Margaret later married a more acceptable match, photographer Anthony Armstrong Jones, whom the Queen created Earl of Snowdon. The couple had a tumultuous relationship, and Elizabeth was often a surrogate mother and steadying force to her nephew David and niece Sarah. Elizabeth and Philip had their own rough patch in the late 1950s. In 1956, Philip went on a tour without his wife aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, during which he opened the 1956 Summer Olympic Games in Australia. Rumors of infidelity followed the prince. 
but by 1960, a decade after the birth of Princess Anne, the couple had patched things up and added to their family with the birth of Prince Andrew. Prince Edward followed in 1964. In 1966, a mining disaster in the Welsh village of Aberfan cost the lives of 144 people, most of them children. Prince Philip visited the village the next day, but the queen hesitated for a week. She feared that her visit would distract from recovery efforts, but her lack of response was considered callous and is now one of the biggest regrets of her reign. In 1969, the Queen's eldest child, Charles, was invested as Prince of Wales in a fanciful ceremony at Carnarvon Castle. The 1970s and 80s were difficult decades for the monarchy. For a thousand years, the institution had, for the most part, been treated with great respect. But as the nation experienced a devastating recession, more and more Britons were questioning the place of the archaic monarchy in the modern world. Punk band The Sex Pistols released the song God Save the Queen, a searing criticism of Her Majesty, in 1977 during her Silver Jubilee celebration. Despite being banned on BBC Radio, the song became a huge hit and reached number two on the UK singles chart. In 1981, while riding her horse during her birthday at Trooping of the Colors, Elizabeth was shot at six times at close range. She was shot at again in New Zealand a few months later. In 1982, the Queen woke up to find a strange man in her bedroom at Buckingham Palace. After a short chat with the man, she called for security. Throughout the 70s, Prince Charles had an affair with a vivacious young woman named Camilla. But it became clear that the royal family would not accept a marriage between them. Camilla wasn't from the right sort of family. Royals pressured her to marry her old boyfriend, Andrew Parker Bowles. But she and the prince continued an on-off relationship, even as Charles married the woman hand-picked for him, Diana Spencer. She was demure and beautiful, a fairy tale princess, but the public didn't see the unhappiness in her marriage until later. On her honeymoon, Charles was more interested in reading than in his new bride. He tried to stay away from Camilla at first, but they rekindled their affair. The queen had very little sympathy for her lonely daughter-in-law. As she had been born into royalty, she couldn't relate to how difficult it was for Diana to transition from a private life to constant royal duties and media scrutiny. Diana became incredibly popular with the people, both for her glamour and for her charity work. So as the unhappiness of their marriage was exposed, Charles and Camilla got the blame. That same year in 1992, two of the queen's other children split up with their partners. Princess Anne's husband, Mark Phillips, was discovered to have fathered a child by another woman, and Anne's love letters to another man were published. Prince Andrew's marriage to Sarah Ferguson also hit the rocks. Sarah was unhappy at being left alone for months at a time while Andrew served as a naval pilot. Again, the queen couldn't sympathize, as her time as a naval wife had been the happiest of her life. Sarah was photographed sunbathing topless while her financial manager sucked her toes, and the marriage ended soon after. The queen called 1992 her honest horribilis, or horrible year, because on top of all the drama with her children, her favorite home and namesake, Windsor Castle, caught fire and was partially destroyed. When it was announced that taxpayers would foot the repair bills, the public was outraged. The queen was already exempt from paying tax on her massive fortune, on top of receiving millions of pounds a year from the government. The queen finally conceded that she would pay income tax and pay allowances to minor royals from her own pocket. The amount of taxpayer funds the British royals receive, how much private wealth they actually have, and what political influence they may have used to protect it remain controversial. In 1997, Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris while being chased by paparazzi. 
At the time, Elizabeth was on holiday at Balmoral Castle with her grandsons, William and Harry. The outpouring of grief around the world was enormous, but was met with silence from the Queen, who remained hidden for over a week. She was more concerned with supporting her grandsons, who had just lost their mother, but her lack of public response was seen as cold-hearted and out of touch. In 2002, Elizabeth celebrated her golden jubilee, marking 50 years on the throne. Later that year, she lost both her mother at 101 and her sister Margaret at 71. In 2005, Charles was finally able to marry the woman he had loved all along, Camilla. Charles's eldest son, Prince William, married university friend and commoner Catherine Middleton. Their glamorous wedding and popularity have gone a long way to win back the hearts of the public. Just before the birth of their first child, a new Succession to the Crown Act was passed, changing from male preference primogeniture to absolute primogeniture, which gives daughters equal importance to sons in the line of succession. Prince Andrew came under fire for his friendship with sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein and was accused of having sex with an underage girl. He has since been asked to step out of the public eye and has given up all of his charity patronages. Charles's second son, Prince Harry, announced that he and his wife, American actress Meghan Markle, would be stepping down as senior members of the royal family. Their explosive interview with Oprah Winfrey carefully praised the Queen, but accusations of racism and ignoring Meghan's distressed mental health were levied against unnamed members of the royal family. On April 9, 2021, Prince Philip, the Queen's husband and companion of 73 years, died just two months shy of his 100th birthday. He was laid to rest at Windsor Castle. Despite the many scandals among the British royal family, the 95-year-old queen remains very popular. Though she has a reputation for formality and a stiff upper lip, she is renowned for her personal touch and good sense of humor. She is also noted for her brightly colored outfits and matching hats. This is a fashion she adopted from her mother, who felt that she should be easy to spot in a crowd. While Queen Elizabeth is the longest reigning monarch in British history, she is not yet the longest reigning monarch in the world. But she doesn't have long to go before breaking that record. If Elizabeth makes it to May 27, 2024, she will overtake Louis XIV of France and become the longest reigning monarch in history. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.